Good Eve. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and welcome to Vampire Review. I am Moartai of the Long Box of the Damned. <laughs> yes, we have a very special vampire review to share with you. Because we love vampires. Oh, yes. I also like werewolves. What? What? To his crypt. Anyway, vampires. Tonight, we will examine one of my favorite tropes the Monster Mash. The, man. the Monster Mash! It was a graveyard smack. Let me ask you what is better than a vampire? Well, 13 vampires, duh, but other than that, better than a vampire is a vampire joined by other magnificently macabre creatures of classic gothic horror. Just a wee little maven living in Southern California, I visited Universal Studios Hollywood, where I first witnessed the glory of the Monster Mash in a live stage show, Beetlejuice's Rock and Roll Graveyard Review. An angel's smile is what you sell. You promised me heaven, then put me through hell. At the time, little snob that I was, I was offended that. Beetlejuice, who wasn't a real monster, was the leader of this group, and that the Phantom of the Opera, who was my favorite monster, was filling the role of Butt Monkey. But despite my offended preteen sensibilities, I couldn't deny the glorious brilliance that is the Monster Mash. This trope is named after the 1962 novelty song, but the idea of the just sheer awesomeness of putting classic monsters together into a freaky X-Men style team crossover situation of the most horrifying of the horrifying has been going on almost since the monsters first became pop culture icons, thanks to the classic silver screen films by Universal Studios in the 1920s and 30s. Frankenstein's monster first met the Wolfman in 1943's Ghost of Frankenstein, but it was in 1944's House of Frankenstein that Dracula joined the mix. Three or more monsters and you have a mash. It's like a murder of crows or an unkindness of ravens or a cauldron of bats. A mash of monsters. Abbott and Costello met Frankenstein in 1948, and with Bela Lugosi returning in the role of Dracula, the film was a huge success for Universal Studios. And then, when the classic films gained a resurgence in popularity with the help of American TV, the studio seized on the fad and the general appeal of categorizationalists by branding the group of characters and their films Universal Monsters and marketing them as a set. Kind of like the Disney princesses of horror, except Universal did it first. There were toys, costumes, games, collectibles, most of which featuring the five biggies. Dracula, of course, the Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, and the Phantom of the Opera. The Bee Squad includes the creature from the Black Lagoon and the Invisible Man, and if they want to throw a woman into the mix, it's usually the Bride of Frankenstein. Though, despite the fact that he was one of the first Universal monsters, the Phantom is usually the first to get booted from the collections. Just like he was from Beetlejuice's Rock and Roll Graveyard Review. When I learned years later that he'd been replaced in the show with the mummy, I vowed my revenge on that toilet paper covered zombie. Why am I doing this again? Because I need the practice. The day will come. 
But despite of, or perhaps because of, the continuing success of the universal marketing strategy, when it comes to film nowadays, these classic monsters often aren't really considered scary anymore. But that's failure to scare, plasma breath. Ooh. The 2000 animated feature Monster Mash is a surprisingly insightful critique on the changing tastes of the media-consuming public as the classic monsters are outmoded by modern horrors. This is an embarrassment! An insult to monsters everywhere! Chicky, wanna change channel? We'll have them thrown out of the Ghoul Guild! They battle an existential crisis and a court case regarding their cultural significance in a jaded world that's no longer frightened of the likes of them. You are charged with the most serious offense! But your ogre, we were once the scariest monsters around! Um, I was even the first Ghoul Guild president! Yes, that was a different era. There is now a more effective generation of fiends. But even though we now get mashups and crossovers of the modern stuff too, the classic gothic monsters are still popular favorites. Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman aren't ever going to go away. We lay moose. I have a remedy for our predicament. Into this customary. But mm -hmm. I've noticed an interesting transition in their dynamic over the decades. Instead of being depicted as frightening villains, they've become lovable comic relief characters, or heroic underdogs, or identifiable protagonists. The last time a film really tried to make a Monster Mash frightening in a contemporary setting was 1987's Monster Squad, which, being a children's movie, was a lot more comedic than scary. Wolfman's got Mars! And let's face it, it was just a Goonies ripoff. In 2004, Universal Studios attempted to revive the intimidating respectability of its Monster Mash glory days with its very non-comedic Van Helsing, set in Victorian times. It was a noble effort. Putting the monsters back in their natural time period, we can suspend disbelief and accept that they're actually scary and formidable. Right? Except not? Don't we make a lovely couple? I don't know anyone who's impressed by this movie. Probably because it sucked. Seriously, we're supposed to be intimidated by Richard Roxburgh's can't be over the top Dracula? Yes! Why do you think I brought you here? Give you this castle, equip your laboratory. Universal, that was the best you could do? I mean, the Victorian setting helped a little, but in modern settings, forget about it. Frankenstein's just pretty lame compared to Freddy Krueger or Pinhead or. It's okay, you guys. Will you play with me? And you know what? Yes. I am just going to call him Frankenstein. He is Dr. Frankenstein's child and therefore also a Frankenstein. Frankenstein is his last name too. His only name. Adam is just a metaphor. But enough about Frankenstein. This is a vampire review. Let us focus on the vampire's role in the Monster Mash. Classically, this is filled by Dracula. When compared to the other monsters in the lineup, Dracula is portrayed as the baddest of the bad, the frontman, the leader, or if they're fighting each other instead of working together, he is the primary antagonist. He is a darker, more formidable villain than the rest of the monsters, and this makes sense due to his lack of innocence. Oh no, Victor. The time has come for me to take command of him. He is controlling and conniving and always a step ahead of the rest, capable of calculated evil. Meeting adjourned. Most of the other big monsters either don't have control over their monstrousness or are so animalistic that they don't know any better. It's sad that film Frankenstein is like this as it's so different from the book, but the groaning, stumbling creature dominates popular conception. And the Wolfman is like Jekyll and Hyde with the dual nature of the animal he can't control. Werewolves are such a nuisance during their first full moon. But Dracula, Dracula knows exactly what he is doing. His whole shtick is that he earns your trust by playing the gentleman and then betrays you by eating you. And in a way, that's a lot more horrifying than a snarling, groaning beast. Maybe Dracula is not going to rip you to shreds as he mauls you, but he is still going to kill you. And you're still going to turn into a bloodthirsty monster yourself once he does. Dracula is the most intelligent and 
human of this group of monsters. This is the nature of the vampire, the seductive monster that walks among us, complexity of character, frightening truths about human nature that hit close to home. It's why vampires are the best. And this is why, when monster mashes are played straight, Dracula is most often the mastermind of the diabolical operation. Hunt them down. Kill them both. Let it begin. He's also just the most popular of the monsters. Did you know that there are more adaptations of Dracula than there are of any other fictional character? in the world, ever. So, even when the classic monsters are modernized and all given human traits and intelligence, and even when they're all portrayed as good, Dracula is still the central character of the group. The only times you really see exceptions to this are when original characters are introduced. In the Rankin-Bass 1967 Mad Monster Party, the chief antagonist is an original character, but still, Dracula is the one she chooses as her right-hand monster, because he's the best. Who is more evil, treacherous, or sneaky than me? Mad Monster Party really is the ultimate monster mash. If you haven't seen it, do. You can find it on Netflix, and it has got it all. Anyway, no one holds the copyright to Dracula as a character, but the Bela Lugosi popular image of him is still firmly in the clutches of Universal Studios. So when other companies want to do a monster mash, they often create a Dracula analog. The not Dracula is still usually given an elevated status in the group. Count Chocula is the frontman of the monster serials, and in the monsters, Grandpa is the smart one while Herman is the bumbling buffoon. Herman, do me a favor. Mm. When the boys from the Happy Hatch come to fit you with that canvas house coat, please don't tell him you're my son-in-law. <laughs> no, it is implied that Grandpa's either descended from Dracula, perhaps even Dracula himself in a way, but the portrayal of the character is an entirely original twist from the Bela Lugosi classic. But then there are the mashes where we don't have a Dracula at all. This is when the role of the vampire in the mash begins to grow less significant. When Alan Moore wrote League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he deliberately did not include Dracula. He was afraid that Dracula was too popular and would overwhelm the ensemble cast dynamic. However, in the 2003 film version, Mina is made a vampire. And she's the brainy one of the group. Though this really partially has more to do with token chick character cliches than the fact that she's a vampire. Speaking of females, let's take a moment to talk about Monster High. The teenage bratsified version of the classic MASH, where the daughters of or gender swap versions of the Universal Monsters are all in high school together and have a passion for fashion. Think Mean Girls without the insightful social commentary. The Mattel dolls premiered in 2010, and by Christmas they were a huge hit. I was actually working at FAO Schwartz in NYC that year and we couldn't keep them on the shelves. Draculaura was the first to sell out, followed by Frankie and Claudine. Yeah. By November, actually, the only one we had left was the box set of the token brown girl and the boy. I wonder why? But of course, the vampire was the most popular. She's a vampire. Also, it may have been in part to the fact that she was the pink one. And being color-coded pink, I assume that she was the central character of the monsters. That's how Barbie did it. Not so. The launch of the dolls was preceded by a crafty marketing campaign of an interactive kids website and animated web series where the dolls were brought to life with established characters. When I finally got around to watching the cartoon, I was shocked to find out it was Frankie who was presented as the protagonist and Draculara was her mildly socially awkward foreign friend. That's bold! <laughs> See, I just did that right now. <laughs> uh, no offense. 
Contextually, this makes sense as Frankie works better as an audience insert character, being only 15 days old and new to school, whereas Dracula is 1600 years old and serves as an exposition dumper. And I guess it also makes sense that Pink's become a sidekick character since Barbie's glory days. Marketers think girls are too cool for Pink now. But honestly, I can't help but feel that this time, the change in vampire dynamic is in huge part to the fact that these characters are all made female. Frankie works as a quirky, clumsy teenage girl, but if these were all boys, you know the Frankenstein equivalent would be a bumbling oaf. And the Dracula equivalent? Of course he'd be slick and formidable. Why is it so different once they're girls? There's a feminist dissertation in here somewhere. And. Why were the dolls so popular with little girls, since when do little girls like monsters? Well, duh, since Nightmare Before Christmas. Now talk about a merchandising giant. More than 20 years later, Disney is still milking that cash cow for all it's worth. Monster-themed collectibles may have been forever relegated to oases of nerdery like comic book shops, but Nightmare was a huge force in making gothiness socially acceptable and even cute and pretty. Boys and girls of something strange. It was a hugely culturally important film that rekindled our society's fascination with macabre at just the right age, for my generation at least. One cool thing about Nightmare as a Monster Mash is its focus on original characters. It was a brand entirely of its own. There are twists on classic characters, including Lugosi-style vampires, but these characters are all relegated to supporting roles, and they never emerged as fan favorites. Because all the monsters in the film's universe are humanized, there's nothing special about the vampires. They lose their complexity edge and are uninteresting next to the novelty of the original characters. Speaking of humanizing the monsters, I've noticed an interesting trend. Even in situations where all the animalistic monsters are intelligenceified, put on an equal playing field with the vampires, there's still usually one that isn't. The zombie. There's still just footmen and the moaning articulate, always a lower class of monster. But you know, I don't really mind this. Zombies don't have a place in the traditional monster mash. Like Beetlejuice, they aren't classic gothic horror. I mean, don't you just hate it when you're holding a meeting of supernatural creatures of diabolical terror, you know, real monsters, and then some reanimated dead guy just shows up? I know I do. Monsters! I've gathered you all here today! We will take over the world! Nice guys in Fedora. Yay! Yeah. 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 Hey, so sorry I'm late. This cute little girl thought that I was the angry video game nerd, so I bludgeoned her to death. No! No zombies! What are you doing here? No. Get out! Oh, get out! Zombies are not allowed. We don't like zombies. Okay. Probably wasn't any brains to eat in here anyhow. Wait. I understand why I'm here. I understand why the were snail is here. Well, what is he doing here? Well, uh, he's just creepy. Oh, yes, he is creepy. Yes. Very much. Yes, fair enough. I'm uncomfortable as we speak. No, I know. <sighs> Zombies. Anyway, monster meshes have become rarer as time goes on. At least the serious ones have. Is that because the classic characters are such friendly household names that it's always going to turn out lame when the media tries to make them scary again? In recent years, television has found success with a slightly different trope known as the supernatural kitchen sink. It's the difference between the monsters and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where you have potentially absolutely every kind of supernatural creature you can think of together in one universe and lots of each kind, giving the show unlimited monster potential and a never ending supply of original yet vaguely familiar characters to make drama out of. Most of the shows feature vampires, and in shows like Being Human and True Blood, vampires are still both main focus sympathetic characters and also primary antagonists. The biggest bads as a society, even in a universe filled with other kinds of monsters. Even in Lost Girl, the protagonist is a succubus, which is a vampire spinoff. Because... I, I've made it clear why, right? It, it's not just because I'm biased. But you know what? Even if the days of the classic old-fashioned monster mash are gone for good, it's nice to know the vampire still holds the scepter in the monster pantheon. And I'm not about to allow you to forget it. I am the maven of the eventide. 
Let's do the match. He did the monster match. The monster match. It was a graveyard smash. This is more like I'm doing the monster mash potatoes. Someone needs to Photoshop me monster mashed potatoes. I would so eat that. the castle east, to the master bedroom where the vampires feast. The ghouls all came from their humble abode to get a jolt. You know, it's because of prejudiced bitches like you that we're not allowed to get married in Florida. Even though Disney has a zombie day! Well, I'm glad that's taken care of. Yes, yes. Anyway, I want to say something. Why? I understand why I am here, and I understand why the were snail is here. Mr. Were snail, yes, so oh, so scared. But what is he doing here? Huh? Oh, well, he, he's just creepy. Well, he is. Yes, I mean, you true. know, yeah, I stay up late at night. That's that's good. Put the lampshade over that. In the thing. shadows. Yes. yes. Oh, thank God. Horries are stupid. No one's he's, creepy. He's stung. Yes, I mean, it's very strange. Very strange. Very, no, strange. No, very odd indeed. Yes. But you're powerful to the dark force. Oh, yes, yes. I like your tie. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>